I'm Megan O'Sullivan, Chair of the North America Trilateral Commission. Um, as you've all seen, uh, Jean-Claude, our, our European Chair, has joined us. I'm, I'm not sure if we have Dr. Tanaka as well, but we'll, we'll um, welcome him if we do catch a glimpse of him. Um, it has been some time since we as a commission have discussed the COVID-19 virus directly since I think in August when we heard from Dr. Tony Fauci in the same forum. But of course it is a, a reality that we have all dealt with on a daily basis and something that's permeating how we think about today, how we think about tomorrow and in the, in the more distant future. So. Uh, to, to have another perspective on this, we have a wonderful duo to take us through some of the latest developments. As is my practice, I'll introduce our moderator and let her uh, introduce our main speaker. Um, I'm pleased that we have a Canadian member with us today to moderate this conversation, and it's Dr. Heather Monroe Blum. Many of you know Heather. She is a woman of, of many talents. Um, she is the chairperson of the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, but she she is also a distinguished academic, being um, the vice chair of McGill University. And something that many of you may not have known, at least until the last year, Dr. Monroe Blum is also a psychiatric epidemiologist, uh, which makes her perhaps most well suited to this conversation. I'm very pleased that she's here with us today. She's going to introduce uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, but I just can't uh, resist jumping in and saying that I am a, a friend and long time admirer of Dr. Gawande and um, have wanted to have him speak to this group for a long time. He's somebody who is making a, a real contribution to this critical moment in a number of ways, and I'm excited to hear from him. So Heather, uh, over to you, and thank you again for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. And let me just say to you uh, how grateful we all are as members of the Trilateral uh, to have had your leadership through this past year. and. Uh, to celebrate the alacrity with which you and colleagues moved to uh, create this program that's kept us all together. So, uh, so kudos and uh, with big personal developments and all, uh, so much appreciated and to Richard and to Cassandra as well. So with that, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever uh, you in the audience may be uh, situated. Uh, bonjour, bienvenue à tous. Uh, it's a, a special uh, pleasure in particular to be able to interview our very uh, distinguished guest, Dr. Atul Gawande. Uh, he is well known, but let me just say briefly, he is a brilliant polymath. He's a scholar, surgeon, writer, public health and health systems analyst, and currently a member of President Biden's COVID-19 advisory board. You'll know him as well for his best-selling books like Being Mortal, and his high impact writing in the New Yorker for over 20 years. Of course, you've seen him also on PBS recently and he's become a trusted voice of science and medicine in the context of the great uncertainty surrounding COVID-19. Given our theme today, the future of the pandemic, I uh, encourage you all to read if you haven't, uh, Atul Gawande's outstanding February 8th coronavirus chronicle uh, titled Inside the Worst Hit County and the Worst Hit State in the Worst Hit Country hugely insightful and a test for each of us on readers of where we sit on the optimism pessimism scale. So with that, Atul, I welcome you. And I'm gonna move right to uh, the first question because I know everybody wants to hear from you. And that is um, for our, our global audience here today uh, and looking at this as a global pandemic, something that connects us all around the world what explains the disparate strategies and resulting outcomes from countries around the globe, globe, including those in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and North America? Over to you. Thank you. Um, and first, thank you to all of you for the invitation. Thank you to Megan and thank you, Heather, for um, our chance to convene in advance to plan out this conversation. I um, also just want to add a slight corrective, which is that I'm the former member of the transition of the Biden-Harris transition uh, COVID-19 advisory board with the inauguration and the um, issuance of the national coronavirus strategy, uh, our role ended um, on January 20. So the uh, uh, I'm now, we were always external advisors and remain that way. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the global 
pandemic is interesting to me because of how many different pathways people have taken. You basically can describe um, along two quadrants, uh, along four quadrants. You have the, the countries that had an early and uh, effective response and stuck with it. Uh, and those countries have been um, quite few. Those have been places like Australia and New Zealand, which people hear a lot about. But it's also been countries like Thailand and Vietnam that have been, that acted early and have consistently had low rates of transmission. Much of Asia falls into this category. Uh, the second category are the places that uh, uh, acted late, had a bad uh, experience, and then largely brought it under control, although the variants, the strain, new strains, are stressing those countries. And those places were the Italys and the Spains and the UKs that tack, hit it early on, much of the EU, uh, and, and were overwhelmed uh, as they hit the pandemic, then were able to pull together and bring the pandemic under reasonable control, uh, feet came off the pedal to a certain extent, and the strains have really uh, accelerated spread and made things more difficult more recently. You have the countries that um, were uh, very effective early on and then, uh, and then became uh, more of a problem. And to some extent, that effectiveness may have been just luck. Um, you saw places like Sweden or Russia that weren't hit very bad early on, and uh, and then it's gotten uh, the death rates rose quite high, um, and uh, there has been continued challenges with getting the plan in an effective place. And finally, of the places that were that that did not pull together and get it under control in the beginning, and did not pull together and get it under control late, the United States falls in that category, Brazil falls under that category. I used to list India in this category. India has been fascinating and I think reflects the story of what it takes. So in by September, India remained a place that with the United States and others were just had rapidly accelerating disease and it looked like India would overtake the US as having the highest spread in the world. Um, uh, or India would overtake the US as having the highest spread in the world. And then they, um, uh, then they didn't. Uh, the one of the critical things that happened was that the country pulled together around wearing masks and did it early. They did it early and in a committed way before Europe did. Um, the US actually um, was, you know, had many pockets and embraced masks while others did not. Um, India, reached the point where they not only mandated masks, they would issue tickets if people were wearing them below their nose. In the major cities with outbreaks, they got mask use from all, you know, what, what appears to be 98, 99% from various measures uh, in most locations and are well beyond 90% mask wearing uh, around the country. And that, and though it was a country with very little resources to deploy for testing, uh, they're only just now getting vaccination underway. Um, they have shut down the virus and it has been at low levels of spread um, throughout this later period. Um, what that speaks to is the single most important weapon that we have in public health is communications and the ability to speak as uh, leaders with one voice. When the political leaders split from their own scientific and public health leadership um, when, you know, there's a pattern of early on governments wanting to deny and think that the public health people are, are doomsayers um, and wanting to put a rosy spin on things, wanting to say this isn't so serious. And when that happens, it's been consistent over and over again, uh, things fall apart. Uh, the it's interesting also that there are many, there's been global rankings of pandemic preparedness now for a decade. Um, countries like the United States have been at the top of those rankings, but they, but uh, what's been clear is the rankings were missing one core element, which is how powerful and how important it is that you have alignment and communication 
to the country and around your policy planning between the political establishment and the public health establishment. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, and that leads right into my next uh, question. Uh, we're in a new era in the United States under President Biden. Uh, yet we face the fact that uh, over the past year, we've seen loss of life, loss of jobs, loss of social connection, and the resulting stresses on mental health and social cohesion. Now we have the availability of vaccines, and that holds out the promise of some return to some kind of normalcy. Well, we can talk a little bit about what that means. But we also know that the race between achieving herd immunity and the growth, growth and spread of variants will dictate a continuing requirement for social distancing, for wearing masks, for hand washing. So my question is to you, uh, maybe your favorite question, uh, what will a good day look like 12 months from now? Well, it's, um, it's very interesting as I think about it. And this is one area where we may well end up with the divides around the world and how we manage this. Many countries, not many, uh, in the wealthier world where they've been able to purchase, get advance agreements on purchase of vaccine, you're seeing um, more and more rapid uptake of vaccination and appropriately targeting those over 65, those in critical infrastructure like healthcare workers, and those who have two or more high risk comorbidities for um, having COVID. The consequence of that, I think, you know, you see the UK where they've already reached uh, over 90% of everyone over 70 um, and will likely have reached um, most of the target high risk, pop virtually all the target high risk population by uh, early spring. In the United States, I think we could have, you know, be reaching a substantial proportion of that population in early spring. We will, um, uh, barring escape variants, and we'll talk about that, uh, that really take off, we will be in a place where uh, hospitalizations and deaths drop dramatically. Um, and when they've dropped below flu levels, we will have an interesting conundrum. We will now have a, a virus that continues to circulate because there won't be pediatric approval of um, vaccines until the end of the year. So you'll have a big young population where it can still circulate. You will have uh, pockets that are not taking the vaccination. And those tend to be between the ages of 20 and 50 that you have the highest vaccine, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it resistance, but at least vaccine hesitancy. Um, that we will be in a place where I suspect we will find that the vaccine does not completely eliminate the ability to transmit, that there will be some evidence of significant transmission. We have to wait to see what the science shows on that. And uh, you'll have enough pockets where there's continued circulation that the disease will not have gone away. When it's below flu levels of death and sickness, uh, the willingness to keep wearing the mask, the willingness to keep pushing vaccination, the willingness to keep chasing down the therapies um, will become a, a societal battle uh, with you know, public health folks pushing harder to try to get, it, um, to get it down further and others tolerating levels of um, some persistent levels of hospitalization deaths and, and, and high circulation. It's gonna be very challenging if there's a lot of circulation to keep us in a, in a place where people are um, not wanting to return to full normalcy and just expect that the science will be there to keep coming up with the vaccines to, to, to as, um, as escape variants emerge. Um, so, you know, my prediction about where we'll be in 12 months is we will probably be largely normal with a significant amount of virus still circulating. And, um, and finding ourselves trying to navigate how much death are we willing to tolerate rather than the question of, can you really eliminate the disease? Yeah, I wonder if you could just follow up on one of the points. And there's a lot of anxiety about vaccine hesitancy. And in our exchange yesterday, you said there may be a different way of looking at that. 
uh, what, the, what the anxiety is about it and what the actual reality will be as, as vaccines become available at the local level. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things. One is that, um, that you have to separate what is actually anti-vaccine, uh, an anti-vaccine movement from those who have um, uh, anxiety and concern about taking the vaccine. Um, in the situation where we are now, the level of willingness to take the vaccine has really risen substantially. Um, in the United States, the latest poll is that it's 71% of Americans, if they were offered the vaccine today, would take it. Um, and that's the highest it's been. The number of people who are uh, you know, dead set against the vaccine are, um, and you know, are basically anti-vaccine are around 15%. In Britain, they prepared for um, the population over, over 65 to um, have a 75% level of uptake with 25% refusing the vaccine. Instead, they've so far reached all of the 70 year olds and above. Um, it's been over 90%. They have 97% uptake of people between the ages of 75 and 79. So the, um, I think as you know people, and get to know people around you who've taken the vaccine, as you see tens of millions of people uh, safely coming through and not having the disease. And while we still see lots of circulation of you know, millions of actively infected uh, people with the coronavirus across Europe, the United States, and um, Latin America, you will, you will have people who rightly choose, you know, your choice is, do you want the coronavirus or do you want the vaccine? And, um, and the right answer, even at young ages, uh, your likelihood of death from coronavirus has gone up at every age group from age 25 up. Um, and uh, for the first time, you've had declining life expectancy at every age group. And, uh, and so taking the vaccine uh, is going to be the best choice for most people, it you know we will come down to uh, what happens when the virus feels like it's subsided, um, and uh, and then people um, being slower. You know, it's that it's going to be getting past that seventy percent that will be a challenge. Um, getting the kids in and others that will that would be required to um, really fully control the disease. I'm skeptical that we would eradicate. The disease. Yeah, it speaks very much to your point about communication. And I guess not just at the national and state level, but at the local level as well. And, uh, and, and the power of continuity of the messaging around uh, what the best thing to do is and a lack of contradictory voices. So that brings me to, to that question um, of the polarization of communication, especially on social uh, media. And it does strike me that the polarization is greatest where the data are weakest. <laughs> um, school openings, wearing of masks uh, in the park when you're outside, aerosol versus droplets, et cetera. How can we constructively engage discussion about these ambiguous issues where the data are weak, but it's clear that particular behaviors are going to take us in a better direction than others? Well, and, you know, it's interesting, you have a mix of areas where early on, for example, on masking, the data was limited. Um, a lot of it based on what the experience with SARS was, et cetera. Now we have very solid information about the value and the polarization has continued. Um, we've also seen this around school reopenings that there was very little information. Um, there's now enough natural experiments that we're seeing and, and real evaluations that we're now seeing data that have come out from Scotland, from Singapore, from North Carolina, from other places showing what's worked in schools and what hasn't. But, but the positions hardened during that period of, um, of lack of information. And when there are politicians who exploit that difference to, um, uh, to attack the, you know, the provisions or to suggest there's another direction to go entirely, 
then you have, uh, that's when you get real problems. Um, you know, my article on mine at North Dakota was about the fact that in the fall, North Dakota had just a massive uh, outbreak. It was, um, you know, an Italy level outbreak in, 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 uh, in the fall, they had the largest spread in the world. Um, I, and I was in the county that had the highest spread in the, in the, um, in the biggest, in the state with the biggest amount of spread. And, and, and a city council, I covered a city council vote on whether in the city they'd issue a mass mandate because at the state level, the opposition had remained so strong. And my puzzle, I started writing about this in October, could see this was happening just like it happened in Bergamo, just like it happened in Spain, just like it happened in New York and Boston. And would democracy, is democracy so frayed that we would not actually be able to, to respond to the crisis? And you know, I thought it was an optimistic article. Other people found it very pessimistic, but to me, it worked. Democracy, the fight, everybody stayed in their corners. There was no consensus, but they voted in a, a mask mandate. They, um, you know, it, it passed five to two in the city council, and then they, you know, got people, got the message moving. And the public responded with uh, getting up to 90% mask usage from being fairly negligible six months before. And the, um, and that fact, the fact that they could get that far, respond, and they got an 80% drop in their hospitalizations, in their cases, and in their deaths. Um, I noticed today, however, you know, the foot came off the pedal. The governor had ultimately, in the heat of it, imposed a mask mandate, put in the restrictions on bars and restaurants three weeks ago. We hit 80%, great, let's open up again. They restarted, they gave permissions for funerals and weddings and opening the bars and restaurants and, and removed the mass mandate. And the last three days, you've seen a substantial jump in the cases. We'll see if that continues. I, I fear it will continue. I think the interesting pattern of this is this is an invisible problem with a delayed effect. The actions you take now don't take effect for four weeks. And we have a bad math problem. Uh, we see that 75% of the spread is from people between the ages of 20 and 50, and 93% of the deaths are in people over 55. For leaders, that is a very hard set of just facts. You're working against an invisible villain that you have to ask people to make tremendous sacrifices. And the bulk of the sacrifice falls on those under 50 to stop a disease killing people over 50. And, uh, and that leads to polarization and opportunity for exploitation, especially in the places where the, the science is uh, suggestive, but not definitive. And where have we heard of this before, right? We see this in climate change. We see this in, in many, many areas where um, we are most challenged about leadership. Yeah, and it also speaks to the incredibly um, tense dynamic between economic uh, renewal and recovery and uh, health protection. And uh, we know from many studies that people will choose their livelihood over health, especially if the health uh, impacts are longer term or, as you say, uncertain. So it, it, it is a conundrum. Um, let, let, let me move then just on that to, to healthcare systems. And um, We've seen the uh, really um, important success of the recovery trial, the trial looking at treatments for uh, COVID-19. And does this suggest to you a tool that single payer systems are better um, systems both for uh, getting um, uh, large scale research findings quickly and accurately and maybe implications as well for healthcare delivery? Yeah, so it's worth unpacking. I don't mean that to be a rhetorical. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean it to be a rhetorical question. No, no, no. It's 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 not actually. <laughs> uh, the um, uh, so the recovery trial in the UK was able to be performed because they had pulled together. It, it, it's a massive trial that has supplied um, most of the mo much of the valuable information um, about what treatments actually work, and it involved banding together some more than a hundred hospitals. Uh, to agree 
that um, they would all be part of a research study that as people get admitted, they would, they would be um, offering in a randomized way the different treatments that wanted to be tested and the National Health Service helped coordinate uh, and provided a single data source that made it really easy to discover, hey, azithromycin didn't work, uh, but uh, a cheap steroid, dexamethasone, cut deaths by one third, and they got rapid turnaround results. We should have been able to, you know, I, I don't think that's exclusive to single payer systems. I think that's the kind of research consortium uh, the United States could have had and many countries could have had um, uh, for, um, and, and we still need, um, we need to be able to capture people that are not hospitalized and, uh, and conduct large scale tests because we still need uh, therapeutic, strong therapeutics for people with mild and moderate disease, given that we have new strains emerging that evade our monoclonal antibody therapies um, and, and, uh, and will continue to. The, the larger question though, which is uh, that we have seen the ways that countries have committed to having everybody in a national health plan, not necessarily a single system, but a national health plan and assure that everybody is, has a doctor and are connected to healthcare has made uh, the rollout uh, far more successful. Um, in countries like the UK and Israel, which are at the top of the distribution and administration of vaccines, that combination of everybody being inside a system. In Israel, it's a private-based system, but it's four HMOs. Everybody belongs, to, everybody belongs to a doctor and to a system that can reach out to them recognize when they've gotten their vaccination and haven't gotten their vaccination, get the priority people in and administer at large scale. Um, when those countries also combine that with acting early to have secured, uh, made advanced purchase commitments for doses, those countries have been able to fly and move much more quickly. The US has caught up, but you know, as a country that has not had a uh, organized health system, we, we have, look, we've had a basic set of gaps around our ability to recognize where do we have masks, where do we not have masks, where do we have ventilators, where do we not have ventilators. So, you know, it, indeed, before the whole thing, we have a third of counties that don't have obstetrics units. <laughs> we have more that have no inpatient psychiatry. And we've never had a mechanism for saying, we're committed to making sure that the systems are there for the entire country. Uh, and, you know, it's stunning to say, but you know, no surprise now that we're in the epidemic, we therefore find it hard to say, has everybody got access to a test? What is the testing, where are the testing gaps and are we closing them? Now we face the same problem around the vaccine. And, you know, we have many deserts uh, for access to, you know, actual pharmacy deserts where you don't have pharmacies <laughs> and you have uh, deserts for therefore getting access to vaccination and things like that, that we're scrambling to execute on and, and, and deliver. And I think, I think coming out of this, that, that is a clear, uh, another indication for having a, uh, a national commitment on healthcare. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask one more question before we move to the audience, but I would like to suggest that those who have questions for Dr. Gwande, put up your um, uh, electronic hand uh, and you can go to your system depending on, on which system you're using. Uh, but typically it's a three dot system that allows you to go in and look at how you put your hand up or it's just sitting as a, an icon of a hand and you can, you can press on that. So um, Atul, maybe, maybe for a last a question before we go to the audience, and I'm gonna save one for you at the very, at the very end of our, of our session. Um, maybe we could talk about children a little bit because you referred to, to kids earlier on and, and there's so much ambiguity. Um, a recent study came out of Germany, uh, kind of a detailed survey looking at the cost of the pandemic on kids. And we see there's been just tremendous um, so all of the things we know, social isolation, uh, disruption, uh, educational um, uh, disruption, and a big impact, um, a dominant impact on mental health and stress and anxiety uh, in particular. When we think now about the ambiguity about vaccines for kids, 
Um, and I think still, uh, certainly in, in uh, North America, it would seem a lot of um, disruption around school closures, school opening, uh, moving back and forth between the two. What do you say are just a couple of things we ought to be thinking about to ensure that we don't have a group of um, children and adolescents who are gonna kind of miss a generation in their healthy development? And of course, we know some kids are harder hit than others, uh, depending on where they are. I think it's overwhelming evidence we have to get the kids back in school and that we can do it safely. Um, studies out of Scotland, out of North Carolina, um, in particular recently have established that um, when that there are a few key ways of, of safeguarding the students, it turns out to be exactly the same as in the hospitals. You, um, if you wear masks in the schools, uh, you um, provide for symptom screening so that people with symptoms are uh, kept at home um, and you have frequent hand hygiene, those elements allow you to uh, create an environment that's actually safer than the home. The, the kids who are more remote are, uh, and, the, and, the, and also the teachers, are more likely to get infected than if they're in the school. So it's not just as safe as being in the community, it's, it's more safe in the controlled environment. Um, second, that um, there, the additional measures of adding testing, um, adding, uh, adding vaccination, uh, add further protection on top of that. Um, we have not turned out to need to retrofit the schools in any major way. Um, if the kid with, with the, expectation enforced that the kids would wear masks, certainly for K through eight, but we're also seeing evidence in the, in the high schools that um, you, uh, you don't need to have six foot distancing. Uh, we see this in the hospitals, right? We all wear masks. I spend all day at an operating table, elbow to elbow with half a dozen people. Um, we screen for symptoms. We don't test everybody. We know that people can be asymptomatically infected, but that the masks help prevent infection. And, um, and we've had, uh, we've been able to have virtually no outbreaks, um, despite, ha you know, having the thick of the pandemic all around us, and seeing workers get infected, um, uh, virtually all through the community with, as I said, you know, we've had one cluster outbreak, ironically, at the lowest level of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, um, I've been able to power ahead. So my take on schools is that now the evidence has come clear that we can return. We're in a place where there is enormous variation around the world in willingness of the teachers and the parents to return to school. But we have the early adopters and now a, and, and, you know, seeing larger groups that are um, that have been able to return to school and, um, and maintain safety. I think the final part on that is many schools have had a trigger based on how much virus is circulating in the community to shut the school down. And we don't do that in the hospitals. We know we can create safe environments. And, um, and I don't think that's a good trigger for shutting down the schools. The trigger should be, do you have an outbreak in the school? And most of all, then it's you know making sure you have the right mitigation measures in place because those can be stopped. Yeah, that's a very clear message, and it's a it's a very it's a very helpful one. Do you want a final word on predicting uh, vaccine um, availability for kids and the data that'll show us uh, efficacy? Yeah, the the trials in the um, for example the Pfizer vaccine um, they announced that they will have results in the summer from their twelve and up uh, population tests and the AstraZeneca um, vaccine they launched their trial now for six years old and up so I think by the end of the year we'll start to see vaccines approved at successively younger ages but it'll be a while. Great, thank you. We'll move now to uh, colleagues participating from around the world. I'll go first to Cecilia Soto. And then Cassandra, I'll ask you if you'll read out one of the uh, questions that's been texted in. Cecilia, over to you. Uh, you're, you're, oh, good you're morning. Hello. Hello, good morning to everybody. 
doctor, I have a, I have a question about the strategy of vac vaccination. Where should you start? In, the, in Mexico, the government of Mexico uh, has decided to start by the poorest communities and the more um, isolated communities. I think if they are isolated from society, they are also isolated from, from virus. But they, they decided that, um, I think because they're, they're, there's still small availability for, for vaccines. If you have a decent um, provision of, of vaccines, where should you start? By the um, communities um, where you have small incidents of, of, um, of the virus, so you could, um, you know, you, 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 you should uh, have them safe, or you, should you start by the communities where um, infection is more, um, more active? Yeah, um, we're all coping with a, tr a situation of tremendous scarcity, although, you know, um, countries like Mexico are particularly deprived of supply, and that's a major issue. Um, under conditions of scarcity with a vaccine that's mainly demonstrated to reduce the likelihood of hospitalization and death, um, I would uh, strong and, and in a context where the B117 strain is now spreading globally with a 30 to 50% higher rate of contagion and an increased likelihood of putting people in the hospital or dying, I would distribute to those who are highest at highest risk of, of dying and to the people who manage the critical infrastructure. And you know, virtually in, in most of the places around the world, they have put their healthcare workers, nursing home staff, um, and first responders for police, um, fire, et cetera, first, uh, along with their oldest age groups, often starting at 75 and up, and then, but needing to get everybody, you know, down to at least 60, 65, and um, people with two comorbidities. The, um, it needs to also, I would argue, when it's particularly scarce, target in the communities where you have the highest degree of spread, and those are often the poorer communities. Isolation varies. You know, in the United States, our biggest areas of spread have been in many isolated rural communities where there's poor healthcare infrastructure and not a lot of uh, following the public health measures, as well as in our Black, Hispanic, and immigrant populations um, due to crowding and congregate living and, um, and other realities of having to be, you know, those are often the essential workers. So in those communities where you have the highest spread, targeting the highest ages, um, you know, so I would distribute geographically and by, uh, by risk of death. Thank you. Great. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. Cassandra, could we have a question please from those that have been texted in? We have a question from Mr. Leonard Levy. Should the U.S. use the Defense Production Act to substantially increase production of N95 masks by 3M Corp? Should the U.S. distribute N95 masks to all people over the age of 50 years old? So um, I think that the Defense Production Act should be invoked. Um, there, there's complexities around what the Defense Production Act can do to enable more production. There's also just I think the more basic thing, which is guarantee that you're buying the supply. There, it, you know, there's a company called Ameritech that has 30 million N95 masks sitting on their warehouse docks, not being distributed. And they're asking permission to ship them to other countries that are willing to buy them. And you know, we're simply not buying them and we should be buying them. I think we should be distrib distributing. I don't think we need to distribute N95s, although that would, you know, would not be, um, uh, a bad idea. Many fi people find them uncomfortable to wear, but I would be distributing. I'd send to every American right now five medical grade masks. Um, we know that the medical grade masks with a metal nose clip over the top um, or cloth masks that have that clip just fit better. Um, there is issuance of, of now more evidence showing that even if you have a cloth mask, wearing a, a surgical mask, mask over your um, over your cloth mask, or it's the other way around, wearing the cloth mask over your surgical mask creates a better fit 
and a much more effective prevention of transmission. With the new strains going out, I would ship masks to people and a better quality and show people what the features are that create a better fit um, because this is going to be critical to stopping the B117 variants. And globally, we see over and over that commitment to masks really makes a difference. Great. Thank you for that uh, question and great answer. Uh, Donald Graham, welcome. And your question, please. Thank you, Heather. Dr. Gawanda, you have uh, talked some about the variants. Three different ones have been described in the uh, non-scientific press. Could you explain the differences among them and which are spreading the fastest, perhaps outside the countries where they were originally identified? Yes, um, great question and thank you. Uh, B117 is the variant that was first identified in the United Kingdom. It is now all over the world across the US. And in the United States, we see that it's spreading at a rate that is um, a doubling time of every 10 days. Uh, and so it's moving fast. Um, that variant is a, has genetic mutations in the spike protein, which is the portion of the virus that jabs into cells and allows it to, um, to take over a cell and, and, uh, and, and uh, succeed in spreading. And it, its spike variant attaches to the receptors of the cell in ways that bind much more tightly, so you don't need as much virus to cause more uh, infection. That is the one I said has a higher rate of contagiousness, 30 to 50% faster, more spread, and also increased rate of hospitalization and death. And that's the one that alarms me right now the most that's spreading rapidly. Um, it does not evade the vaccines. The vaccines that we currently have are effective against it. And we've seen in the UK and Israel that um, where they've achieved high levels of vaccination, they're now reducing the um, the uh, occurrence of, of disease and hospitalization. And so that is an important part of the strategy. We're in a race around the rest of the world to get the vaccines out so that you can um, contain, uh, avoid, start, start reducing the spread of that virus. But the masks are critical because we, we will not distribute vaccine fast enough for that to be the strategy by itself. The other two variants that you referred to one is out of South Africa called B1351. Another out of um, uh, Brazil called P1. The, the critical thing is that they, they have all of the features of the UK strain and additional uh, mutations that allow it to further um, start to not be recognized uh, as readily by the vaccines. So, there is some reduction in effectiveness of the vaccines. We don't fully know whether it evades the vaccines. The, the studies we've had so far seem to suggest that they do prevent severe hospitalization, severe illness, prevent hospitalization and death. And that's the important measure of the vaccine. And so we, you know, we're watching very closely. South Africa has a controlled uh, evaluation of 100,000 people being um, uh, vaccinated with AstraZeneca's. Uh, you have um, people who are being vaccinated as, it, as these variants spread in the United States. Um, so we'll learn more, but very clearly, already you have the vaccine manufacturers generating booster shots or updated variants that allow for, um, allow for um, protection against the, the new mutants. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna say they already have their version ready to move into testing. The FDA in the United States will come out with their criteria for how to approve them, much the way that we approve variants on the flu vaccine every year. Um, I suspect will be the, the methods that come out, um, but, but that will be an important part of this. We will see whether we end up needing an annual booster if there is continued circulation and mutation of these viruses. Great, thank you. I'll move uh, Juliet Kayem to you for your question, please. Uh, good morning and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm a huge fan. I wanted to ask um, about the public health communications because I think for those of us who aren't 
in that space, but on different spaces, logistics, advising, private companies and stuff, I would say it's not been perfect. Um, uh, and so I wanted, what do you think were the biggest mistakes and then sort of the lessons learned? Um, uh, and I'll just give you an example. I think the public health community lost the um, economic debate early uh, by sort of focusing on social distancing and isolation and sort of not addressing the economic impact. It really did, at least in the US, allow a counter narrative by sometimes not well-meaning people and sometimes well-meaning people that the public health guidance was uh, brutal <laughs> and uh, and had an impact. So that's that was my sort of takeaway from 2020. Yeah, I, I you know, there's, um, this is a challenging uh, area. So let me try to unpack a few things. Yeah. Number one, I don't think we can hope that the public health community will speak with one voice on, you know, on the on, on all of these things. There, you know, in the absence of evidence, there's bound to be really great experts who are falling on either side of what some of the data tells you. Um, but, uh, you know, early on, for example, a lot of criticism of different points of view on whether masks would work or not. You know, they were not relevant in prior coronavirus outbreaks or, or didn't seem to be um, quite as important. Uh, but more and more evidence came to show that, in fact, these are aerosolizing um, uh, viruses. And so that commitment was there. I think a big mistake was when public health people moved beyond making recommendations on the evidence and started saying, uh, this is what we think you should do because we don't have a good supply of medical masks. That's a, that's a political judgment to be made. And then people do lose trust when you say, I'm not recommending masks, even though we think the hospitals need to have them for protection because we're worried that if we recommend it to the general public that, um, that you know, the hospitals will run out of them. That, that, that has been costly and I've argued you know, when we turn to other areas as well, we need to not get into the politics of what the public reaction will be, but to name what the, what works. Um, beyond that, uh, let's see, the, the other part of your question was around the messaging of, essentially as one person put it that I'd spoken to on the, um, on the, with, on what they called the pro-freedom side of the debate. Um, was you know these public health people, these healthcare people? It's all death, death, death. Well, no one's talking about the fact that you know the economy's been shut down. My kids haven't been to school in a year. Um, you know we have a rise in opioid deaths. We have a rise in alcohol deaths. We have domestic abuse. Um, now, the the reality is that all of those are rising. If you look at where the job losses are, two thirds of the job loss. Uh, that has occurred has been in face-to-face -face professions. It's been the hospitality industry, it's been travel, it's been healthcare itself. Despite the fact that healthcare has not been restric restricted, despite the fact that domestic travel has not been curtailed in many places, you know, hotels are open, et cetera. Um, and that's because people fear the virus and appropriately do not want to be out and around. Um, you know, the, uh, and the way to get it under control is to address the virus. Now, the public health people, we have, includes me, <laughs> um, have not included that this is not just about the deaths, this is about the jobs, this is about the ability to return to normal. The final point I make, because this is such a complex area, is there is too much coronavirus absolutism. Um, a case in point would be that um, virtually everywhere uh, has requirements on wearing masks uh, outdoors, even when you're beyond six feet from people. We see no spread in those circumstances. We don't have cases of it. You know, we have people not allowed. And, you know, I see, I've been watching the Australian Open and seeing during their snap pause that, you know, people couldn't exercise outside. You know, when, when you don't do that, it, it's like when during HIV, the messaging was people have to not have sex. And you know, in, finally, it just is saying, well, if you're going to have sex, this is how you do it. And this is how you do it safely. And we encourage that. And 
you know, you can arm people to have some uh, semblance of, of normalcy. So, you know, even I going out and about Massachusetts where we're required to wear a mask everywhere, uh, including 50 feet from your neighbors, you walk your dog. I do it, but I know it um, reduces confidence and does not help when in recognizing um, ways people can make these judgments. And so I, I, I agree with you, Juliet, and uh, there's work to be done uh, to address the fact that we have to have a strategy that solves all of these issues. We have to let our seniors out of solitary confinement. We have to get our kids back in schools and, um, and, and uh, make part of our policy how we manage and mitigate the harm. Great, thank you very much. Cassandra, I'm going to ask you to read one more text question and then we'll go to Joe Nye and Richard Fontaine. We have a question from Ms. Mia Kovacic, and she has graciously agreed to uh, voice her question aloud. Ms. Kovacic. Hi, everyone. Um, my question was concerning um, the possibility of immunity or vaccine passports. I know there's been a lot of debate. I work in Slovenia, which is now allowing people who have received their second vaccine shot from certain producers to enter without a PCR test. Do you think that we might have vaccine passports or would this just be a tool that would not actually stop the spread of the virus, but increase discrimination towards certain groups? Thank you. Yeah, so right now what I would say is that we don't have a scientific basis for immunity passports because we don't know that it stops spread. An example, the rotavirus vaccine has virtually eliminated what was hundreds of thousands of admissions to hospitals per year for kids with rotavirus caused diarrhea but it did not eliminate spread of the disease that continues to circulate. Um, it, uh, you can ha you know, have asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infection frequently. And, uh, and so you know, an immunity passport that lets people into your country if they're vaccinated, uh, they could well be carrying the virus. Uh, and, um, and so that's a challenge. There's a bet, CDC just issued guidance that you, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine if you're exposed to somebody. And it's a bet that, and, and I'd say these policies like in Savina are a bet that the science is gonna show this cuts down transmission. And while it probably doesn't cut, eliminate transmission, I suspect it does cut down transmission. How much? One third, two thirds? That would make a difference in the judgment about whether you um, give special privileges to those with an immunity pass, with, with immunity. Um, and I do think immunity passports will evolve if the data shows that we are reducing transmission, say, by half or more. Um, if that's the case, then places are going to start to think that, um, hey, if, if people who could get sick are vaccinated and this cuts down on transmission, that we may begin opening up uh, possibility for more travel, et cetera, for people with vaccination. Or, or to work in certain environments where, um, uh, like elder care and so on. Great, thank you. Uh, Joe Nye, wonderful to see you here with us uh, today. Um, uh, and thank you for all of your leadership that you brought over the, the, the long period of time. Uh, over to you for your comment or question, please. Well, thank you, Heather, and, and thank you to Dr. Gwandi for uh, addressing us. Uh, I must say, as a, as a reader, I've always admired his clarity explaining things to people like me, and he's just as good in, uh, on video. But I'd like to ask about the World Health Organization. Um, Biden has reversed Trump's foolish step of leaving the WHO, but nonetheless, there's still a fair degree of legitimate criticism of the WHO. Many people I know in the scientific community feel that the WHO team that went to Wuhan uh, was given a runaround by the Chinese. And the question I think is not, do we leave WHO, but are there ways to reform it? What are the aspirations that we should have to make the WHO more effective? Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. Well, so um, I do think the WHO is hobbled. I think that there's, um, opportunities in, in the return of the US to the WHO to 
try to address some of the defects. Some of the defects are just structural and inherent in the organization. They don't have rights to over, over, uh, over people's sovereignty. And we see over and over again that um, when the WHO makes a public health call that a pandemic has started, uh, that an outbreak is happening in a country, they, um, that it would require them, whether it was in West Africa, whether it was in China or whether it's in the United States, to potentially outpace what the leadership in that country want to say about it. Over and over again, leaders want to downplay the seriousness. There is a major economic hit when you say that there is an outbreak. Countries start banning travel, all of those things. And WHO finds itself tied because they're there at the behest of those countries and then come under severe attack. When it comes to that pandemic, uh, pandemic coordination and making there be a response, like on polio, like in now that we're deploying vaccine, all those kinds of things, it can do really well. And there's much that can be done to streamline. But I am, you know, uh, I, I have wondered whether there's a need for an independent, uh, outside funded organization, not unlike, you know, the nuclear commissions that you have uh, been part of setting up that can have the expertise make the un, unpopular calls that there is a violation in the case of nuclear agreements or that there is a outbreak in the case of public health, which um, a member consensus-driven organization like the UN and the WHO simply are not in a political position to do in, in the kind of timely, unpopular way that's required of public health professionals. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're going to need to finish up our questions with uh, Joe's uh, comment there. And uh, with that, uh, Atul, I want to thank you profoundly for the extraordinary uh, uh, contribution that you made this morning. Uh, and uh, for our colleagues around the world in different time zones. Uh, you've just covered um, uh, a remarkable breadth and depth of information to uh, help us all think about um, uh, our current context in the pandemic. You've reinforced very dramatically the, um, uh, the importance of communication, clear communication and, uh, and solidarity around the messages that we know will have an impact. And so with that, I wanna thank you and to thank everybody who's participated for uh, uh, your contributions uh, through, through questions and your presence here uh, today. So with that, thank you. And uh, Megan, over to you. Great, uh, it's nine o'clock, as you said. So I just want to briefly reiterate your thanks and, and to thank you, Heather, for taking us through this conversation. Thank you, Atul, for being such a voice of clarity and expertise on so many of these critical issues. Um, wonderful to see everybody, and I, I wish you well for the rest of the day, and, and stay healthy.